Welcome to the 2024 EWTN Family Celebration from Toronto, Canada. Please join us for the opening prayer given by Father Joseph Mary Wolf. Good morning, family. If you just sit for just a minute. You know, when um, Mother Angelica first moved to Alabama, they were trying to raise funds to help support the monastery. And they decided, well, why don't we roast peanuts? And so they were roasting peanuts. They were doing very well. They supplied the Daytona Speedway and several grocery stores, and they were turning over these peanuts. And one day a man comes and he says, Mother, I'm the new commissaire for this. We really like your peanuts. Well, she said, well, thank you. He said, we, we need some money for advertising. And Mother said, you mean a kickback? <laughs> and his eyes got real big. Well, we like to say advertising now. She said, well, I'm not going to pay it. I'm not going to lose my soul over peanuts. <laughs> and then she went on to say that, could you imagine being in hell and saying to somebody, well, what are you here for? Peanuts. So Mother teaches us how to have courage, and so our theme today is to stand firm in the faith. And we have so many challenges to our faith today, and what a beautiful thing that we can be here together to encourage each other, and we pray that our talks and all of the adoration and the Mass this evening is going to help to encourage you to stand firm in the faith. So why don't we stand and we'll now pray and ask God to come and to strengthen us, to have the courage that we need, the zeal that we need in these days. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Mother Angelica. We thank you for the ways that you've already been at work in our lives, inspiring in us, inspiring us and strengthening us, helping us to go forward with courage. We know that we are weak and we tend to waver. Help us to stand firm in the faith, to encourage one another today. We pray that you, O Holy Spirit, may give us new gifts of fortitude, give us courage, Give us, as Mother said, guts to stand firm for what is right and true and beautiful. Come, Holy Spirit, and, and come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, Grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. And Mary, on this first Saturday, we know that you had so much courage as you had to give birth in a cave, that you had to fly to Egypt, that you were with your son and his cross. Pray for us that we may be your children and be faithful to the Lord to the end as you were. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you and this day, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless. Now here's a look at the history of EWTN. Mother Angelica, 
Born in 1923 in Canton, Ohio, Rita Rizzo knew poverty and suffering at an early age. Her parents' divorce filled Mary Rizzo with anxiety and depression, surrounding her six-year-old Rita with fear and isolation, both at home and at school. Then at age 19, a miraculous healing from a recurring stomach ailment opened an entirely new world to Rita. She realized that God loved her personally and profoundly and answered this love by entering the poor Clares of perpetual adoration in Cleveland, Ohio, becoming Sister Mary Angelica of the Annunciation in 1945. If it was a cure that brought Mother Angelica to enter religious life, it would be a serious accident that launched her into a whole new adventure she could never even have dreamed of. The accident was a back injury, which threatened to leave her paralyzed for the rest of her life. The night before her surgery, Mother Angelica made a promise to our Lord. I said, Lord, if you give me the grace to walk again, I'll build you a monastery in the South. The surgery was successful, and in 1962, Mother Angelica and a handful of nuns moved to their new home on the outskirts of Birmingham, Alabama to found the Monastery of Our Lady of the Angels. In the 1970s, Mother Angelica began to write small booklets of inspiration and encouragement in the Catholic faith. The booklets, printed by the nuns themselves and distributed free of charge, would find their way to every corner of America and beyond. Invitations to give talks and lectures followed. And then came videotapes and their broadcast through local TV. And then there was that memorable afternoon in 1978 when Mother Angelica was struck by the small size yet powerful potential of a TV station in Chicago. I said, Lord, I've got to have one of these. A few years later, with $200 in her hand and an unshakable trust in divine providence, Mother began to transform what was to have been the monastery garage into a TV studio. It was 1981 and the beginning of the Eternal Word Television Network, EWTN. Name of Jesus, who is Lord, may his eternal word be proclaimed. Eternal Word Television Network, built for you. EWTN began transmitting just four hours a day, but thanks to the generous and enthusiastic support of its family of viewers, by 1987, EWTN was firmly established as a 24-hour cable network in the United States. The next step came in 1992 with the launch of its radio service. At the touch of a button, EWTN instantly extended its reach to the entire globe, bringing Catholic radio programming to the farthest corners of the world. Three years later, EWTN gradually began expanding the scope of its television service as a number of satellite transmissions were launched in Europe, Latin America, the Philippines, Africa, India, and beyond. Today, using the latest technology, EWTN's television and radio programming is available around the clock and across the globe via cable and satellite, reaching millions of souls throughout the world. It was Mother Angelica herself who many years ago insisted that the words news service should be placed on our letterhead alongside the words television, radio, and internet to describe the core services EWTN provides. The addition of EWTN News Nightly, the National Catholic Register, and CNA were additional steps, fulfilling Mother's vision for EWTN. As in its earliest days, EWTN continues to operate its 24 hours a day, seven day a week broadcasts based solely on the generosity of its donors, while in turn offering programming free of charge via satellite, cable and broadcast TV, radio and the internet, 
EWTN's mission is to respond to the call for a new evangelization by putting the media at the service of the gospel. On Easter Sunday, March 27, 2016, Mother Angelica returned to the arms of the Lord she spent her life serving. As we now carry on the mission God first entrusted to Mother Angelica, we celebrate her life and legacy, confident in her continued prayers and intercession for the work of EWTN. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Warsaw, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of EWTN. Thank you, thank you so much. Welcome, welcome to this family celebration. We've got such an amazing, amazing crowd here. We've run out of room here in, in this particular room, so we've got overflow everywhere. This is absolutely a joy. It's a joy to have all of you with us, whether you've come from near or far. Uh, these are just such wonderful, wonderful events. And I also want to welcome all of those who are joining us today on our EWTN live stream, as this event is being uh, live streamed around the world on our digital platforms, and those who will join us when this airs on the EWTN television networks uh, in a couple of weeks. So, whether you're here in the room joining us from around the world or we'll see this later, welcome. I'm so happy that you are here with us and that you've chosen to be a part of this great family celebration here in Canada. For me personally, being in Canada is always like coming home. It's part of my roots. Uh, I've shared before when we've had events here that uh, my family uh, were actually among the earliest uh, settlers of uh, Quebec. Uh, that's not the Warsaw side of the family, in case you were wondering. But uh, So I always feel a, a great connection uh, with Canada and being here uh, on Canadian soil. And uh, you have just been so supportive of EWTN here in Canada throughout these many, many years that EWTN has been a part of the media landscape uh, in Canada and, and around the world. Um, of course, I'm, I'm also particularly happy that we're able to gather today under the mantle of Our Lady, uh, with uh, Our Lady of the Cape, Notre Dame du Cap. Uh, it's so beautiful to have uh, the pilgrim statue here with us, uh, and, and as, as she begins her journey, uh, around uh, the country and around uh, the world over these coming months. So uh, the, typically in the um, U.S. events, we gather with an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, since Mother Angelica chose to found EWTN on the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1980. So Our Lady has always been an important part and protectress of uh, the mission of EWTN. These family celebrations began uh, almost 20 years ago when we uh, started our 25th anniversary celebrations. Uh, in that first year, uh, someone had the bright idea, that would be me, uh, to do six family celebrations in a year. Uh, we almost didn't make it to our 26th anniversary based on that, uh, but uh, there have been wonderful events and we've just enjoyed them so much uh, over these years and really, they're about two things. One, our ability to say thank you to you, our EWTN family, uh, for your love and support of Mother Angelica and EWTN and our mission through these years. So it's really us coming to you, our family, uh, and, and being here in your home and bringing everyone together so that we can say thank you for all you've done for EWTN throughout these many years. It's also an opportunity for us to uh, give you a glimpse into a day in the life of EWTN, to share with you the opportunity to meet uh, some of your favorite program hosts, some of the people who host uh, different uh, programming on the network, uh, and, and the friars, and all who play a part in making EWTN a reality uh, every single day. Um, and so we've got a great, great day ahead of us. Um, as Father Joseph said 
uh, in his prayer. Our theme today is to stand firm in the faith. All of us, wherever we come from, know that these are very, very difficult times in our world. They're difficult times in our church. There's a loss of the sense of truth, of objective facts. We're in a post-truth society. And so what we need to do is to remain strong, remain firm in our faith. That was why Mother Angelica founded EWTN all those many years ago, was to give hope in dark times, to encourage people in their faith, to encourage people to live an authentic Catholic life. And so that is our theme today. That is why we are here. That is why we've come to be together as an EWTN family. So thank you so much for being with us today. And we have a great day ahead of us, some wonderful speakers. So why don't we go ahead and get started? We now present the homily from the Mass at the 2024 Family Celebration given by His Eminence Thomas Cardinal Collins, Archbishop Emeritus of Toronto. One of the great joys of my life in the last several years is to be the Episcopal advisor to, the, to Sarah International. It is a wonderful uh, community and group of lay people who are devoted to doing the one thing that Jesus asked us to do in concerning vocations. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. And they do any other things as well, but it's, it's a wonderful group. And it's named after Saint Junipero Serra. So I've gotten to know more and more about him. He was the founder of California. If you wonder why you have cities in California named the Angels, Our Lady of the Angels, and Sacrament, and things like that, Saint Francis, San Francisco, it's all because of Father Serra, the great evangelist of, of the Western United States. And as I read more and more about his life, there's a spirit in him that is extraordinary. And it's a great thing. He, his motto was, I don't know the Spanish, was siempre adelante. <laughs> Hope I pulled it off. <laughs> always onward, always onward, never backwards, always onward. That's the spirit we need as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the spirit we need in Catholics to evangelize the world always onward. Well, he had troubles. He had, his leg was very much infected. He walked across Mexico with you know, barely able to move, but he did it. He kept going, always onward. Disasters, horrible things, amazing things, just, and always he was there with a fire in his heart to serve the Lord, not a kind of a timid, tepid thing. I think I remember seeing, I've often thought of a photo I once saw of a, a swimming contest. And you see all the swimmers, they're there along the edge of the pool, and the photo clicked just the moment after they had left the edge of the pool. It's called commitment. <laughs> they're going in. And that's what we need to do, dive in. Always onward, not dip our toe in, in the pool, you know? No, what a way to live, what a waste of life, you know? We, we're called to be like Junipero Serra, always onward. I think of other people who come to mind. Now, they're not like him. They're not saints like him. But I think of the great Lorenzo il Magnifico, who was a, a ruler in Florence in the, around the medieval times, late, in the early Renaissance. He was called il Magnifico because for the sake of human glory, he never did things part way. He was the magnificent. He, he was, did things always the very best for earthly glory and fame and all of that. He never did anything less than the best. He was magnificent. You don't want to be good down in history as Lorenzo the piddling or something like that, or Lorenzo the incomplete or the incompetent. No, Lorenzo il Magnifico. And for earthly glory, 
he did things the very best. Whereas Junipero Serra did it for the glory of God. That's the difference. And that's something which should inspire all of us. We are disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, the ruler of the universe, who came into this world, who suffered and died for us. This is no minor, unimportant thing. We are baptized, we are confirmed. The power of the Holy Spirit, not just to sit back and, you know, we don't want to have on our tombstone a, a channel changer, you know, click, 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 you know. We won't want to be couch potato Catholics. Not allowed. Always onward, siempre adelante. That's the way to do it. That, well, that way you can evangelize the continent. You, know, you can put good Catholic names on the whole of California, for that matter. That's the spirit which should be in us. And again, not out of a sense, not as with perhaps, I don't know, Lorenzo. I did not have, he's been dead 500 years. I don't really know him. But I, I know, he may have been a very fine and good man. But I think it was largely for the sake of earthly success that he was magnifico. The father Sarah was magnificissimo because of Christ. And that's what we need to think of to be touched by the Lord. And like those first apostles who dropped everything and ran and followed him, like Peter jumping out of the boat just to get to him. It is the Lord. Oh, amazing. Wow. Wow, amazing. That is the spirit of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a disciple of the Lord. He changes us, he changes the world. He is the Lord of the universe. I remember whenever in my time as Archbishop here, I would, uh, well, I better not get too, because you, you might know what I'm talking about. I better be a little fuzzed up, fuzz, 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 fuzz. Whenever I would get frustrated about some of the things that Archbishops get frustrated about, in the, even within the church, in the, the kind of uh, infidelity, <laughs> anyway. Things would be, sometimes you want things to, to be on fire and instead go like that. I would in, I'd write little notes and I, I'd end off with the wonderful thing. It used to be, I don't know if it still is, it should be, the uh, call sign of Vatican Radio. Christus vincit, Christus regniat, Christus, Christus imperat. That's the way. Christ conquers, Christ rules, Christ is Lord of all even though idiots are doing, anyway. <laughs> I use that word too much. I should use it about myself more often. You idiots, what, but anyway, my, my, my dear friends, and my assistants when I was there, say, you shouldn't use that word so much. But anyway, okay. good for them. And so I just simply, we need to have this spirit, not a boastful about ourselves. Heaven knows we're, we're all sinners. That's very important realize that. I'm sure Father Sarah knew that very much. And he was, had his own faults and weaknesses and inadequacies and everything else, of course, he did, as do we all. But he was on fire with the love of Christ. And that's what matters. That's how we evangelize as we infiltrate this society so hardened, so Old, so lonely with the dust of secularism. Dust. Nothing there. No there. there. We got to see that little friar come roaring in. Adelante! <laughs> you know, and faithfully. Remember, as it says nowhere in the gospel, life is a marathon, not a sprint. So I'm not talking about doing kind of glorious things fast, you know, big splashy things. I think flashy things are probably kind of useless, basically. They waste a lot of energy and give us the illusion that something's been accomplished. It's that slow and steady, but joyful, powerful service of the Lord. And I think we're called to think about that as we read the readings today that speak to us of the joy of serving the Lord God and the joy of having the Messiah amongst us. 
the prophet Isaiah writes in the time, the first reading today, where everything was going wrong. This was disaster, disaster, you know, it's not a happy thing. And there was no way that the people of God were going to be able to, I don't know, do enough to turn the tide in a purely physical way. Say to those who are of fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. That's what our Lord said, you know, be not afraid. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. And that's what Jesus means. Yeshua means the rescuer, the lifeguard, the one who jumps in and saves us. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. New life. That's what we proclaim in our faith. That's the hope that sustained the people of Israel in ancient times of the coming of, of new life of the Lord to be with them. No, they didn't. They're probably Isaiah and his human, you know, he's just a, he's a prophet. God knew what Isaiah meant, but Isaiah didn't quite get what all of Isaiah meant. You've got to remember in, in, the, in the Bible, there are two authors for every book of the Bible, the human author and God. God's more important. So the human author, he may have been thinking of rescuing the people by, you know, uh, getting and beating the enemy or something. But God used that because he's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. And when God comes amongst us, not clinging to his divinity, the second person of the Trinity entered into this world, emptied himself, and he came amongst us in our Lord Jesus Christ the rescuer, the anointed one, Jesus the Christ. And what did he do? He did these great miracles. He was going to, not just among his own people, the chosen people to whom Isaiah was speaking. He was speaking of rescue coming to the, the chosen people. No, no, no. What, Jesus has just performed a miracle with a Syrophoenician woman. She's a Gentile. She's not not one you would, uh, you know, really look to as getting that kind of reward. And he's going, actually, it's, it's odd here. Returning from the region of Tyre, Jesus went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. So he's going all over the place to be in the Gentile lands, the lands of the people who are outside, outsiders. That's where the light is coming as well. He's sharing it. And so he comes to this man, a man who was deaf, who'd had an impediment in speech. And that term for impediment in speech is exactly what they use when he says, the ears of the deaf un unstopped, the lame shall, he will come, the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. That's, he's quoting Isaiah when, he's, when he does this, when they talk about this. And they begged him to lay his hand upon him. So Jesus took him aside in private, away from the crowd, he may have been a bit sensitive to the man, as he's sensitive to everyone, just come aside. And just the two of them together. Imagine being called aside by our Lord Jesus Christ. And this poor man, afraid, and, and then he put his fingers into his ears, spat, touched his tongue. This is the most physical miracle you're gonna get. Sometimes he just simply says, but this time it's very, it's very sacramental. This is how. God comes to us and gives us hope. Because we're not angels. Believe me, we're not angels. <laughs> I think Mark Twain once said, God made man a little lower than the angels. And we've been getting a little lower ever since. <laughs> so here's this man who's got this, he can't speak well, he can't hear and, and all that. Then he looked up to heaven, he sighed, he groaned. This is, you can hear it, you can see it, you can touch it. This is God with us on our level. That's why we rejoice. Always onward, because he's with us as we're going onward. Not in a distant, icy majesty, but he's with us. And looking up, he says, Athata, be opened. <laughs> wow. And immediately, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Jesus simply wanted to be quiet about this, but oh no, he couldn't. The more zealously they proclaimed this. They said, he has done everything well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And so, we need to think about this. And also live our lives humbly, as St. James tells us too. 
This is the Christianity isn't flashy in a superficial way. Christianity is deep. That means caring for the widow and the orphan and, and not looking at earthly. The kind of thing maybe Lorenzo, without being unfair to Lorenzo Magnifico, if he came into the, uh, the assembly, he'd probably have pretty fancy clothes, but no, no. It's, it, or everyone gets together here. That's not what is special. What's special is our Lord Jesus. And I think uh, little St. Jennifer Sarah probably wasn't much to look at and didn't have a lot of flashy stuff, but he was on fire with the love of the Lord. And uh, that's what we need to be. Have that joy. As Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him singing for joy. Not superficial. Not kind of stuff you can pump up through psychological tricks and chemicals and other stuff like that. It just whoo, doesn't work. And not a confidence and a joy that is based upon our own talents, which are not so much and are kind of useless. We just offer them for the service of the Lord. But a deep joy, a freedom. Be open, be free. Not to be called inward, pulled inward by our own ego but free because we're servants of the Lord who has come amongst us and touched our hearts and touched our tongues and touched our ears and touched us in the sacraments. It is the body of Christ. Amen. It is the Lord. Wow, amazing. Amazing. And yet we take it for granted. And so in our life, if we are to have that same <coughs> zeal for the Lord, joyful Lord, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him singing for joy, with that always onward of Junipero Sarah, it won't be found because we're kind of figuring some way we can elevate ourselves. They're not some kind of talent we've got or whatever other stuff like that. It's not the things of this world. And it's not having all the power and stuff that the person in the second reading probably has and wants to throw their weight around. No. It's because we are servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is more than enough. And so if we're going to deal with the evils we find in our society, and we can find them by looking at all around us, but maybe remember we got our finger pointed to someone else, we've got three of them pointing back at ourselves. We don't want to begin our confession, bless me, Father, for my neighbor has sinned, and let me tell you all about it. <laughs> no. If we are going to evangelize this really corrupt society, with a lot of good in it too, a lot of good people, a lot of good, but a lot of it is not. Think of the violence. Think of the persecution of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Think of some countries in the world where to come together like this is, is, is you know, you get attacked. Think of our brother, well, I, go, I mentioned different places, just recently in Nigeria. These terrible attacks. And we think in Asia and everywhere. I think of another disciple, you might say, of Yedipa Rosera, St. Miguel Pro, Blessed Miguel Pro, the Jesuit uh, priest who was in Mexico, which is also where Sarah passed through, at the time in 1927 of the Cristero Revolt, because it was a wicked government there. And, uh, you know, he has a wonderful photograph of him because the evil people wanted to photograph him being killed. His arms outstretched as the bullets came towards him saying, long live Christ the King. That's the spirit that we need to have. And so that means there's nothing uh, superficial in this. We need to spend time in adoration and prayer. How can we give what we haven't got? We need to get rid of the garbage in our lives and get to confession. And every day, constantly pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Pray the prayer to empty ourselves out of our own, you know, fullness of self. I remember once when I was a seminarian, my first week as a seminarian, they're having the seminarian retreat like they're having right now at uh, St. Augustine's. And this old priest, he must have been at least 60 years old, must have been antique, <laughs> ancient, an ancient of days. Uh, well, he seemed to me when I was in my 20s. I'll never forget, he said, you know, priests, we, this is 1979, 1969, priests are leaving the priesthood like you couldn't believe it. And they're having identity crises. And he said, gentlemen, a priest cannot have an identity crisis. 
because the priest does not have an identity. <laughs> I thought, whoo, that sounds, I think, well, I don't know quite what that means, but I finally figured it out. I think I figured it out about 30 years later. I'm kind of slow on this. What he meant was that we've got to be like Yudin for Osara. We've got to be, let Christ fill us with his life. To you, O oh Lord, to you, O oh Lord. Take, Lord, receive all of my liberty, my memory, understanding, my entire will. It's a wonderful Franciscan called Ignatius Loyola used to say, or, or I think he may have been another order. I can't quite recall which one. But, you know, this is the way we are. So adoration, confession, praying the Jesus prayer, praying the rosary, our blessed mother. And, and a little custom, though, I'll tell you what I, I sometimes do. I'm doing it for years now, but I don't know tell anyone, uh, just quietly, when the priest lifts up the host and the chalice, say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when he genuflects, simply say, my Lord and my God. It must be in our hearts. And it's superficial, it's not enough. It's there that we get the energy to serve the Lord. It's not in anything cheap or passing or superficial. It means to have ourselves ephata, opened up, freed by Christ. That the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. It comes from the Lord. Christus vincit, Christus regna, Christus imperat. That's the way it is. That's the only way. So that's our mission. There we are. And also I'd say too, uh, you know, adoration, prayer, Come before the Lord in silence and read the word of God. Read the gospel, especially one chapter of the gospel every day. I usually have my little red Bible with me, but I don't have it right here. I, just imagine a red Bible. I have the red Bible because the Bible should be read. You can even do it with it. So read a chapter a day. A chapter a day keeps the cardinal away. There we go. So this is what we need to do. We get ourselves to say, Lord, come to me. This is the only way. And then if we do that, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. <laughs> this is what, we, and we're doing it for life until finally we see him face to face. And he asks us the only questions and the only exam that matter. Have you loved the Lord your God with heart and mind and soul? Have you loved your neighbor as yourself? That's our mission. And we're not to be as Catholics with the catholic the whole thing. We can't be so timid. I don't mean we should be ferocious. I mean we should be gentle. But we, not, we should be filled with confidence, not in ourselves, but in Christ the Lord. We can't just be tippy-toeing around things. We need to, in a long-term way, a marathon, not a sprint way, we need to proclaim our faith by who we are, by what we say, by what we do as we put our on the forehead that we know the word of God, speak the word of God, live it with the heart. That way, we will be what we're meant to be and we can evangelize this world. It took 12 apostles, I mean, we can, there, with Pentecostal fire, that's our mission. Always onward, never backwards, in the name of Christ the Lord. Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus, Christus imperat.